Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the greatness of your name, the greatness of your word. We pray, Lord, that you would visit with us tonight. We ask that you would lay your hands upon us, give us insight to the coming kingdom and to the calling that each have to be firmly planted in you. We pray that you would give us strength and wisdom and understanding. We thank you for each one who could come and bless those who could not. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I'd like to continue what we began last week. I um, felt what I would like to do. Remember, I gave you the handout of the thousand and some uh, scriptures concerning the will of God. What I thought I'd like to do is to go through uh, at the at the very end are 200 that he did not categorize. And so I thought I'd just walk through them. Uh, I don't have much to say about them, but I would like to explore them with you uh, with several things in mind. And so uh, so we'll start with a uh, with our PowerPoint. So the first thought I jotted down was, uh, I can't do it. This, it doesn't work. I've tried to do God's will. I've tried to stop sinning. I've tried, 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 and it just, uh, he doesn't answer my prayers and I'm not growing. It's so, so it's kind of uh, a conceptual dead end. So I want to address that because that sense, that feeling that it's not working or that it can't work is, in my judgment, one of the enemy's last attempts uh, to slow down the progress. And it comes from misunderstanding how you as an individual interact with this process. And so we're, we're at a point where I want to start describing that process more clearly. And so I thought I'd spend just a few of the uh, first minutes tonight to kind of address it and realizing that we need to go into it much more deeply than that I am tonight. But I just kind of feel like it would help set some uh, matters uh, more clearly in your mind. One of the difficulties of growing in the Christian life is that it has to be real. It has to happen. It has to be possible. And you have to experience it. And you shall. And the whole process of the gospel is designed so that you can. And so the despair that it isn't working, or I prayed and God didn't answer, or I confessed my sin and you didn't clean, uh, cleanse me, all of that is the battleground uh, that interferes with us pressing on. And if I were to identify one area that lurks in hindering it, and we've talked about this a number of times, is the inability to sense the difference between what we think and what we know, what we believe, that realm with the realm of experience, with the realm of encountering things that are holy, things that are pure, things that are of the kingdom, things that are of ministry, things that are of the Holy Spirit. And making that transition from one to the other, for some is very easy, for some 
it just seems impossible. And so it's the Lord that has to step in. The dismay that it's just too much. And I, I, how can I do this? I mean, I'm, I'm a day late and a dollar short. That dismay has an answer. And that is, it's the Lord himself that will do these things in you rather than you yourself. So it's like we have the Lord's hand where we just about are falling over the cliff and we're holding on to his hand and you know, I'm going to fall. I'm going to fall. It's not going to work. I, I can finger, I can feel my fingers slipping. I'm slipping. I'm slipping. And what the Lord says is, would you just let go? Just release it. You're struggling. You're, you're the man of the hour. <laughs> you're, you're pressing to get this to work. How's it going for you? And of course the answer is I can't do it and it doesn't work. So, so the Lord says, let go, let go, let go, fall, fall, fall over the cliff. And I'll hold you up underneath you will be everlasting arms. And, and the everlasting arms is not a doctor. When the Lord takes you up from a peril, that's an experience. And so when people who are seeking the, whole, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they, they often have the same kind of difficulty. How can I go from speaking in English to speaking in a, in a language I've never learned? And they get stuck on it they, because there's no instruction manual. It has to be an experience. You, you have to be given the gift. It has to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so it's, um, it's, it's a very, very awkward point. But what we are doing is encouraging you that those senses and those feelings and understanding, that's normal. Of course, of course, we're, we're frail and weak. And what do we know? We only know what the Lord shows us. We only, we only experience what the Lord brings to us. And so one of the major ingredients of change from this point forward, as, as we describe it, will be the letting go and allowing the Lord himself to begin to process you that as you draw near to him, you will experience his drawing near to you. And it, it cannot be described anything other than it's an experience. So, for example, we want to delve into prayer to, in some detail because prayer is one of the main ingredients in drawing close to the Lord. But the prayer, well, it comes in a lot of different mechanisms. And so I'm sure you're already practicing some of it. But the kind of prayer that's coming has to be a prayer that you experience rather than a, something that you recite. And so one of the mechanisms to help get past that is I'm going to give you some recommendations, some how to's that whose design is to help you to slow down, take it easy and don't overcomplicate it with effort. In fact, in order to finish what the Lord has called you to, it can only occur as he brings it to you. It's not something you can grasp. It's not something that you can bring to yourself. And so, um, so let me just put up some, uh, some, some scriptures. Uh, John 530, Jesus said of himself, I can of my own self do nothing. There you go dead in the water. 
I can't get it done. It's too much. It's not going to work. But as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I don't seek my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. And that's why the will of God is right in the center of what it is that, that, that slows us down. Uh, John 15, 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me, and that's the goal, to live in him, completely in him. All that you are is in him, and all that he is is in you. There's, there's no overlap. And I in him, the same brings forth much fruit, for without me, you can do nothing. So the statement, I can't do it, it doesn't work, good, good, you're getting there. You're, you're right on the edge. So, uh, and the thing about it is, is it feels like failure. It feels like it can't proceed when it is the very ingredient that allows it to proceed. And so here's a question I'm asking. Why do I obey the Lord's commandments? And there are three answers. Actually, I think there are four. The first one I should have listed is uh, because, because I don't care. You know, I don't care about the Lord's commandments. So that, that's the lowest level. But the next level up is uh, because I have to. The Lord commanded me, I'm supposed to do his will. I'm supposed to listen to him and just accept it and do it. And that's true. But there's a deeper reason, a more elevated reason, and that is because I want to. Now you're getting closer. That's a big difference because I have to and because now I want to. And so I doubt that anyone here is in the level that I didn't write down, sorry, I'm, I'm a quitter. I, I'm not going to pursue it at all. But we're struggling with, you know, this is before me. It's, I read it, I see it, I'm supposed to do it, but it doesn't work. I can't do it. How do I make progress? Well, the way you continue is to press into the desire of wanting to do his will. And so that's one of the fruit of the land of promise. It's a taste, taste and see. That's a commandment. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And stir up within yourself an affection for concerning the Lord's will. And then the third, which is the grandest of them all, I obey the Lord's commandments because I love him. And so that those three one-liners basically describe where we're headed. We're headed toward the Lord enabling us to make the changes inside so that it's something that we want. We know, we know we're a day late and a dollar short, but we want it. We want it, and we tell them we want it, and we're going to press into it. That, that needs to be fully developed. And then what he brings to you on his timetable, in his, with his method, with the dimensions that he wants to include, he then perfects the love of God in you so that your testimony becomes, I do his will because I love him. And so those are three levels of experience, and the writers write about it. It's, uh, it's well established in the scriptures, but it helps, I think, to describe it so that you can measure your own sense of exasperation or, oh my, it's, uh, and realize that as we press on, he becomes the raison d'etre. He becomes the reason for why things can proceed. 
Uh, you can't tear down the walls of Jericho brick by brick, but the Lord sure can with a word, and they collapse. And so we're transitioning into a life, into a realm that in a way is upside down, it's backwards, where we're not grasping and putting it together and learning it and practicing. Uh, we're actually meeting the one who is the only one who can orchestrate it all. And so it becomes his pleasure. And the Christian life then takes on a dimension of uh, you remember Abraham took the sacrifice and he uh, spread it out on the ground. Remember, a horror of great darkness came upon him. Here he is, he's, he's saying yes to the Lord. And what he's getting is, is uh, a horror movie. But what he, and then the birds come. And what he does, he beats the birds away with a stick. And that's our job is to beat ourselves down, <laughs> down boy, down boy, you know, <laughs> so, or we prevent ourselves from being the entrepreneur and getting it to work. Oh, I'm going to understand that. And uh, yeah, I'll put that, I'll put A, B, and C together and watch my smoke. But rather it's a process of making sure that your sacrifice has been made. It's under assault. You protect it but you have to wait for the fire to come and consume it which is god's approval and that's an experience it's not doctrine it's an experience and so i'm portraying this a little ahead of time and i've i've talked about it before to, to help you keep on track to expect this to expect the lord to place in you something that was not there before and you'll experience and you'll realize that he is the lord and he does intend to perfect us he does intend to finish our course and our attempts at doing it before were pretty feeble and you then learn the skill of it's a dance it's um, and you let him lead so uh, so i just wanted to introduce that again because we want this is the territory that is not well traveled but as you hear it if you will turn to the Lord and just say yes and release the conditions that we place on it and wait for him to be the one to lead, to take the initiative, then your progress is much more assured. It's, it'll be much more certain. And it, it, it's not necessarily a lengthy process. It's, it's like learning I don't know, when I was a boy, the big thing was uh, yo-yos and uh, learning how to do a sleeper. And you know what a sleeper is? Anybody know what a sleeper is? Nobody knows what a sleeper Okay, John knows what a sleeper. That's when you fling down the yo-yo and you, and you can get it to stay down and it spins. And then with a little bit of a jerk, you can get it come right back up to your hand. And so that was an amazing skill to learn. And so we were, as boys, we were all obsessed by this skill and doing a, around the world and, you know, the rocking the cradle. And so, uh, but that's not how the Christian life works. It's, uh, we don't piece it together until we finally have built it. And then, uh, you know, if you will build it, they will come kind of thing. No, m most of what we're going to uh, portray has to do with letting it go and uh, participating with the Lord building, building it in you. So what I'd like to do then is to continue um, by just maybe having a comment or so. What I, want, what I want you to see is that what you're being asked to do is not 
horrible. It is not unusual. It's very practical. And the main idea is with a little serious effort, you could read through the New Testament in a month. And in so doing, you'll see everything that God commands. There it is. You're done. Do it again next month. So the fact that over a thousand exist, or if, I know it's more because I, I, I found some that aren't on the list, but um, it's not a rat's nest of difficulty. It's, uh, it's someone who looks into your heart and says, this is what I want. Is it something you want? And you begin to learn to say, yes, this is what I want. And that's, that is the beginning of the final process of finishing in Christ Jesus. So uh, just to give credit where credit is due, these 200 came from uh, Dake study notes, uh, which have been published. And I put the website, when I, when I uh, sent out the handout, uh, last week, I put the uh, the website where I found it, just so that they get credit. So number one, abhor that which is evil. I think it's pretty easy. I think it, I think every time you watch the news, <laughs> it's like, oh, look what they're doing now. You know, well, it's uh, that's not hard to do when you see the wretchedness of man. It produces this sense. I, I don't like this. I abhor it. Number two, a bishop must be, and so what he does is uh, he, he references, and I do this occasionally through the list, that if it's more than one thing, I listed it for you. So we'll go through it. So here are the things that a bishop must be. First uh, Timothy 3, 2. A bishop then must be blameless. So if you're a bishop... This is for you. Be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. And then it goes on. But we do something with scriptures which is a problem. What if I'm not a bishop? Do you think I'm supposed to be blameless? Well, yeah. Husband or one wife? I think so. What we tend to do, and I'm announcing this so that you can guard against doing it yourself, and that is the tendency to read a verse like this and then put in that verse a single word, and that word is only. Only a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, good behavior, given to hospitality and apt to teach. And you can't do that. Uh, you see people do it. Uh, he that believes in his baptized shall be saved. And so they make the verse, only if you believe and are baptized, you will be saved. You can't do that. Because the Bible says elsewhere, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So evidently believe in baptizing works, if that's the right word, but it's not and only. And so watch, guard yourself that you don't seize on a verse and make it so narrow um, that it prevents you from seeing what else the Bible says. And it also prevents you from using it as a bludgeon on others. You know, you haven't done this, so therefore you're bad. So let's continue the list. Not given to wine, no striker. I was thinking about Stryker earlier today. Um, if you ever look at movies from like the 1930s to the early 1940s, men and women hit each other all the time. Man would slap the woman, the woman would slap the man. <laughs> so, uh, I think we've outgrown that, but it was just really odd to see you know, some of the old classics and how they treated each other. Not greedy, a filthy lucre, but patient. Not a brawler, not covetous. One that rules well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. So when it's come when it comes time for a 
a church to select a bishop. This is a good list. And uh, when's the last time you were in a church where they had to pick a bishop? There are some uh, there are some Protestant churches that have bishops, but most most don't. I marvel at that. I wonder why. The next verse says, because if a man doesn't know how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, not a beginner, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. And so beginners have to go through a process that actually protects themselves uh, from pride. If, if someone is young in the Lord and you give them uh, grave responsibilities, they get puffed up and uh, they easily fall. Verse 7, moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. And so I would apply that, by the way, to all believers. It's not good for the world to have a bad opinion of you. There's, there's something that's not working. It pleases the Lord for, for those who are without, those that are outside, to have a good opinion of you. Titus 1.6 If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, we all want that. Because a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no, no striker. And this is Titus where the other was Timothy. And so it's repeating, not given to filthy lucre, a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, and self-controlled. Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine, both exhort and to convince the gainsayers. What I notice is that, uh, uh, Arguments ensue rather than convincing uh, the gainsayers. Abide in Christ, and that's the whole purpose of this pursuit. To abide means not only to live, but actually to what to dwell uh, permanently and thoroughly. Abide with worthy ones. The uh, our lives are to be marked by companionship with others who are like-minded don't accuse anybody falsely i think we avoid that i think uh, i think your heart just tells you if someone didn't do something you shouldn't be telling people that they did add to christian graces so i'm going to give you the list of of what has to be added and this is essential because one of the dimensions of what we're developing for the future is following the Lord who will empower you to receive additional grace on a regular basis and graces that that occur in different dimensions and so this is the appeal to do that and actually gives the dimensions so second peter 1 5 says and besides this give all diligence Add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, self-control, patience, patience to godliness, godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. And so that describes a very real step-by-step -step process for you to experience. It's one thing to understand it. It's another, it's another thing to be able to preach it but what we are pressing for is the actual experience of exchanging your brotherly love with the divine love. For if these things be in you and abound, they will make you, they will make you, not you will then have the ability, they will make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Admit your own unprofitableness. You know, there's just sometimes you just need to say, this isn't working. 
here I had this scheme and it was going to go, you know, this way and that way. And I was so sure. And whoops, I failed. Admit it. Tell the Lord. I blew it. Admonish one another. I'd like to see that done more, but there has to be a certain level of trust uh, between us because if it's not, um, if it's not admonishment that is holy, that is in the power of the Holy Spirit, then it, it is easily received as a criticism. Admonish the unruly. I think we had mentioned earlier about the verse that the church ignores, uh, they that sin rebuke before all. And so um, we're kind of weak in this area, the ability to influence others and correct their behavior. And I think the reason is because mostly what we press ourselves into is carnal. It's not the Holy Spirit. It's not, it's not divine. It doesn't have the strength and health of things that are holy, but it just, it's, it's a personal, uh, attack. And, uh, correcting people is probably until you learn how to admonish, correcting people just probably should be avoided. Just don't do it. Agree with your adversary and one place it says, do it quickly. Don't. The enemy is contentious. So when you're arm wrestling ideas and trying to get to the bottom of something, which I think is healthy, there comes a point when it's no longer working, where it's just, uh, you know, shooting each other. And so somebody, yeah, someone once said, the more mature of the two of you, whoever is more mature will quit first. So allow no liberty to ensnare you to commit sin. One of the things you learn in the new covenant is that there are things that were forbidden in the old that becomes discretionary in the new. And so the Bible scolds us, don't let that freedom that you have then become a snare, either to embarrass or to harm someone else, or it, it, it kind of leads you to believe I can get closer to the edge of the cliff and uh, surely I won't fall over. I don't know if the statistic is true, but evidently one of the dramatic increases in death rate are people who take selfies uh, standing on the edge of the cliff who then step back. We never had trouble with that before. Allow no lust of evil in your, in your body. It's, uh, you have the power to say no. And when it, when it starts its ugly work, it usually doesn't clobber you senseless but begins with a little gnawing it, there's a there's a, if you study sin you will see that there's a preamble there's and we talked about this there's a way that it gets started and that it adds to it and and then it, it it gets nurtured from various sources and then it finally has you and so one of the skills in the christian life is being able to notice that you're being teased uh, ahead of time it's uh, it's kind of like the white line that's on the edge of a, of a road. Uh, it's meant, it's there to tell you you're near the edge of the road. And if you'll stay inside that white line, you'll never run off the road. But if you can, if you think that the white line doesn't really mark the edge of the road, and so therefore I can cross it, then you're just making yourself all the more vulnerable. It's foolish. Allow no cursing and blessing from the same mouth. That's James. And so you make up your mind which one you want. Uh, I suggest uh, the blessing. And, and he goes on to argue that, um, James, that uh, a fountain cannot bear bitter water and sweet. If you have a sweet fountain and you add bitterness, the bitterness wins. And if you have a bitter fountain and add sweetness to it, the sweetness does not win. So that's the difficulty.
anoint your head and wash your face with fasting uh, when fasting. So this is the one time the Lord permits you to be a hypocrite. So don't go around with a somber face. Oh, look at me. I'm, I'm 13 hours through my 24 hour fast, you know, pray for me that I'll make it. I'll make it. You know? No, Jesus said, you know, put on a new dress, wash your face, comb your hair and be pleasant to everyone. Uh, don't put on airs. Don't say, look at me. Remember uh, the Greek philosopher <laughs> with the snow that did it just because people would watch. You know? Arm your mind, arm yourself with a mind to suffer for Christ. There are going to come times. It's not often. It's irregular. And sometimes it's more serious than not. But there are times when you take a hit because of Jesus Christ and your belief. And so uh, you have to arm yourself and be ready so that you're able to absorb it and accept whatever it is that's at hand and say, the Lord is my deliverer. Don't avenge yourself. I think we know, know that. Don't, don't punish people when they are unreasonable and they push at you, they say things that are hateful. Don't lash back. Don't, don't try to set it right. Just say, thank you, Lord. Awake from death delight. It's uh, the Christian life is a process of resurrection. And uh, there are things in you that are destined to be given life and they are lying dormant. And the Lord will touch them. Bear one another's burdens. And so community is an essential ingredient in the Christian life. And so being alert and watching other people and seeing there's a need that I could serve, I could, I could help alleviate that and take it on yourself to be a help. Uh, behave like men, actually, I think that verse is quit you like men. The other is play the man, just step up, do what's right, square your shoulders, stiffen up, you know, lift up the hands that hang down and uh, play the man. Don't bid false teachers Godspeed. So there's a temptation that, uh, you know, I'll uh, pat your back if you pat mine. That's uh, mutual admiration. So when you, uh, when you're engaged in something that is distasteful and you can see that it's not producing, um, uh, the nature of Jesus Christ, it's just better to ferme la bouche, just to hold your peace and don't, don't try to schmooze your way out of it. It's, uh, you're going to say something that, you're, that basically is a comfort to them, um, but you don't want to be a, accountable for something like that. Bring proof of your repentance. I think we make repentance too shallow. We need, I believe, to consider the word penance. We understand repentance, but I don't think we understand penance. We, in modern Christianity, we don't have a place that when you sin and you've done harm in the kingdom, you've done, you're abusive toward God himself. We have fashioned a set of circumstances where we believe we just simply are not punished for it. We don't distinguish between punishment and forgiveness. And so our model of the transaction that we have with the Lord is that when he forgives us, he withdraws all punishment. And that's not the case. Whom I love, I chasten. And so when David birthed the child out of wedlock with Bathsheba, murdered her husband, he lost the child. God forgave him, but he lost the child. 
And so for some reason, modern Christianity has eclipsed that if I'm sorry for my sins, I've cleared the slate and I can go on, not realizing that the Lord himself is the one that takes an account and he will see, um, remember, if you will pay the uttermost farthing, he says, in the case of the person who was so unrighteous and, and not forgiving someone else their debt when his debt, uh, which was much greater, that he was forgiven. And so repentance needs then to be joined with something which is, a, which is provable, something that people can see. Uh, there has to be some sort of change. Not, we've made it too much a simple change of mind. I'm, I've rethought this and so I'm okay now. No, you really should. Uh, there's something called godly sorrow and it should change your affect and others need to see it. It needs to be proven. And that's what this is ex explaining. Bring up your children in the Lord. I think we, we all do that. Build up your most holy faith. And it goes on to say, uh, praying in the Holy Ghost. Uh, we need to pray in tongues more than we do. Call the poor to your feast. Yes. Jesus said, you know, don't call those you know, who, who love you and you love them, you know, kind of a, uh, a nice time together. Uh, we call the poor. It's just exactly opposite from what we are inclined to do. And so when the Lord checks you on that, you begin to, uh, you allow for a change in your behavior that uh, you didn't feel accountable to in the past. Children, obey your parents. I wonder what, what, at what time that uh, is no longer in effect. Uh, if you know the answer to that, I mean, is there a certain age where children don't have to behave, don't have to obey anymore. I don't know. I think the older teach the younger, so. Cleanse the lepers, that requires a miracle. So he's not talking about, uh, you know, fuller soap and a brush. He's talking about being empowered with the power of God. And we need to seek, the Bible says, seek the best gifts. And so we don't cry out enough for the areas where we're told to do something that is supernatural that just simply can't be done except through the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to clamor. Remember the unjust judge of the lady just kept clamoring, kept bugging him. And Jesus said, the father wants to be bugged. He wants you to clamor for these things, but it has to be important. It has to be something you want. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. And so, uh, being done with sin and, and the, the cleansing that results cannot, it's a, such a sweetness and such a power. It's so deep and it's gratifying. Um, I don't know if you remember one of the young ladies, R.C. Sproul, remember he said, this is the will of God, your sanctification. We showed a video and one of the young ladies said that, uh, Holiness to her was pretty, like a pastor's wife. I like that. When something is clean, it's attractive. So dirty hands just spoils the party. It affects everybody. Cleave to that which is good. Learn to make a distinction and keep voting for the good. Keep joining yourself with the good so that more and more the shift of the center of gravity of your life is holier and holier and purer. And at some point, the things that are doubtful um, are no longer present. Collect just news uh, only. This was um, John the Baptist when he scolded the uh, Repub the publicans and said, don't, uh, don't collect something that's not due. So don't, don't push people further than they have the ability. Come out from among them. I think we believe that being salt means that we live among the mess and we show a politeness toward it and we're 
will be inclusive. Let's invite it. Let's invite the sinners to join us, and we'll show them, you know, how how nice uh, the Lord is. Uh, but that's not healthy, and there has to be a division between the clean and the unclean. And the Lord has a way of drawing the sinners to the Lord, but drawing them without the conversion means that the sin lingers and the more the sin lingers in a, in a church, let's say, the more potential it has. The enemy will see to it that it'll begin to influence others. Command and teach these things. And so my belief is that teaching is one of the gifts that every believer has. And so servant of the Lord must be apt to teach. So think about what you know and what you believe and make note of it and construct it so that it's an important dimension to be clear, to make it suitable so that it can be heard and digested and not obtuse and pontifications, but learn it's a skill to sense what it is. What is it that someone needs to hear that takes them on the very next step? That's what they need to hear. If you shoot too far ahead, it goes over their head. If you shoot too far behind, they say, I already know that. You're not helping me. Commit the truth to faithful teachers. And the Bible pattern is that uh, men are to teach faithful men who are then able to give the same thing to others. And there's a certain progeny in ministry where those in ministry hand off what it is that they've learned so that you can then learn it and then add to it what the Lord has taught you so that then that can be added in uh, to someone else who is learning. And so through that process, there's, a, there's an inherent multiplication and it has to be done deliberately. It's not done actually. It has to be done with purpose, with intention. Confess your false one to another. That's a humdinger. You know, we need, uh, we need a certain level of trust to be able to do that. Sometimes people try to do it as a way to shock or uh, get attention. So it's not easy, but being open, humility will help you to confess your faults. A subject comes up in a discussion, you say, you know, I, I just realized I do that. I, I just did that last, just did that last week. I better, I better knuckle down some. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Count it all joy when you are tempted. Usually when we're tempted, <laughs> uh, we hate it because we, we uh, have experienced failure so much that uh, we just feel doomed. Uh, but count it joy because it's through the temptation that the Lord empowers you to say no. Caught off offending members and that's what Jesus, you know, Cut off your hand. If it's offending you, cut off your hand. So sometimes the Lord will prompt you with something in your environment. It may be an object, it may be a person, it may be a procedure, it could be a book, it could be a hobby, where he says, this is an offense and you have to separate from it. It's, it's got to go. And he doesn't overwhelm us with it. Sometimes he sneaks up on it a little at a time so that when he makes the final comment, will you give that to me? You've already been prepared and say, of course, Lord. I, I've been thinking about this for some time. And you're right. Out it goes. Deacons must be. And so here's a list of qualifications for a deacon. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience, and let these also first be proven, and then let them be use the office of a deacon being found blameless. And so 
we need a, me a, a systematic mechanism by which people uh, can grow in our assemblies. And if possible, it helps if it's published, if it's known, um, so that if there's an area of concern in your life, you hear about it ahead of time so that as the years go on, you have time to deal with it so that when it's a proper time, you can step up and take uh, an office uh, in which you can serve well. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife. We've heard that more than once. Ruling their children and their own houses well. Don't defraud. Don't sell. Don't sell someone something that isn't true. Don't don't coax them into circumstances and you know there's a barb in it and you pretend as though it's not there. You know there's going to be a ramification and you hide it. That's defrauding. Desire spiritual gifts. What do you want? What gift do you want? Do you have a list? When's the last time you said something to the Lord about it? Do you want it? Or is it, or do you have to do it? <laughs> so make up your mind. Make up your mind. One way you recognize a gifting is that you should press for is you see it in someone else and something clicks and you say to yourself, I, I think I could do that. I think I could. Well, take it to the Lord. Desire it. That's a commandment. Desire it. Want it. Desire the milk of the word. Make Be very careful that you don't get advanced so fast that you don't know the fundamentals of, uh, of the faith. Remember, we began this by going through Hebrews, you know, the uh, repentance from dead work and faith for faith, uh, the faith of God and so forth. Don't despise prophesying. It is a neglected gift. It's been super, it's been um, exchanged with an apparent, it looks like a, the gift of prophecy. It isn't, it's people who create something in their thinking. It's, it's usually somewhat sensational and it's usually somewhat vague. Ooh, this is going to be a year of change. We're going to have change this year. And it, it's not the truth. And so the prophetic is the ability to describe what it is that's on God's mind, what's on his heart. And it needs to be accurate. There's no, uh, it, it's not a place where you have a wide latitude as long as you're close. It's, that's not so bad. It really needs to be dead on because others are counting that it was a word from the Lord. I like the idea. It says in uh, 1 Corinthians, all may prophesy that all may learn. So my belief is that a midweek Bible study is a perfect opportunity. It's a close-knit group. You practice. You practice. You can practice prophesying. All may prophesy that you can learn. And so it's a, a gentle environment. As long as the leader has some maturity, uh, they can guide you and uh, help you to craft what is it that that helped people along in what you said and what is it that pointed in another direction. That's like learning learning how to crayon and stay inside the lines. It's a, it's a skill. Don't destroy people with non-essentials. There are things uh, that just are not important. And if we a number of the cults are this way, they just they make it important. They insist that it's necessary and uh, it hurts people. Draw near to God. That's what we are urging you to do. Draw near to him and he will draw near to you. Eat your own bread in quietness. You know, don't be a busybody. Don't. Sometimes we just keep asking questions of people. And it's, and it's the lust to know and it's the lust to tell. And it's a lust. And so there's some things you just don't need to know. And so just 
sit quietly and eat your bread. Earnestly contend for the faith. And the reason why it needs to be contended is because the enemy is contended. The enemy is constantly trying to undermine. And that's kind of how we began. It's not going to work, you know, which leads us to give up. See, that's the enemy's strategy. Rather than, I can't do this, it's not going to work. Lord, I need you. <laughs> that's the right answer. <laughs> it should propel you more to the Lord. And so you have to fight. You've got to fight that contention. Edify yourselves with singing. Uh, Ephesians 4, the, Ephesians 5, the Greek says singing and psalming in your heart. I like that. So, I think the Welsh, I have to look this up. The Welsh have, what do they call it? It's, I don't think it's called a psalm fest. But they have a method of singing the psalms, which is unique, unique to their community. And uh, it's really close to uh, singing in the spirit. Edify one another. What is it? What component does someone need that will build them up? What brick is missing that when you give them, not correct them, see? We tend to correct. We tend to tell people what's wrong with them. Be careful on that. Go really slow on that. It's like... Are you sure you're the one to do that? And why do you have the itch? Just let it go. Let it go. Let the Lord raise someone up. Build them up. Find something that when you add to them, they are strengthened. Enter the straight gate. It's narrow. And you're commanded to go for it. So say, Lord, I don't even know what that means. But here I go. I want to I wanna enter the narrow way. And I want to avoid the way that is brought. I remember as a boy, I was in about third grade. Back back then, the teacher read from the scriptures every day, and she would read from this, enter into the you know the, the narrow way, for broad is the way that goes to, to destruction. And I remember saying to myself, I don't want to go to that broad way. Right? Well, that was a grand influence. Uh, and I'm glad for that. I think it I think it's stuck Examine yourself as to faith. It's a good idea. Don't be overly critical of yourself. But it's a good idea to kick the tires and say, you know, how am I doing? It's what, am, I, um, am I building properly? Am I, am I faithful? Am I exercising faith or have I lost it? Exercise in godliness. It's always, it's always good to behave like the Lord. Exhort servants to obey. And of course, back then that meant slaves. Uh, I think it's Timothy or don't remember, but um, the warning was there are some slaves whose master is a believer. And so the slave is a believer and the master is a believer. And so the slave maybe thinks he should get a break. <laughs> and the apostle says, no. Uh, obey your obey your master. Exert one another daily. Uh, how are we going to do that? I'd like to see a mechanism. We started making progress. We had uh, Sunday morning services, Sunday evening, midweek service, uh, weekly Bible study. And then the men would go to church uh, on Saturday and help, you know, upkeep. The property. So that's four times a week. So we're getting there daily, daily. Maybe with our communications abilities, maybe it'll be easier. Uh, but it takes it takes a willingness. Lord, I want I want to be able to exhort one another daily. Uh, fear not. Fear is designed by the enemy to disrupt you. You can see that in the handling of COVID and other things, crime. It's all meant to deliver. It's a deliberate step to instill fear in you. I will fear no evil. I will fear no evil. And so it takes faith. It takes trust in the Lord that even though the threat is real, and even though the threat is pretending, it's close, it's at hand, 
with just a little bit of change, it could overwhelm me and my family. All of that is true, but you have to commit yourself to the Lord. Don't fear these things. Fight the good fight of faith. You know, remember the, the happy prospect of the war. You know, so it is a good fight. You know, put up your dukes. You know, don't don't cave. Good grief. Let them let the enemy know he hit something. You know, kick him in the shins. Just do something. You know, uh, it takes it takes a fight. It you have to fight for faith and um weakening your blows is one of his strategies and discouraging you so that you don't even try is a strategy follow after peace and holiness i don't know if you know what comes after that without follow after follow after peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the lord and so that's an important one there. Follow peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. We um, be careful that your comments aren't making trouble. Jesus wants peacemakers, not troublemakers. Forbear one another. We're all different. We have different views. Some of them are really annoying. Uh, but forbear it. Forbear. It's okay. It's okay. Just let it ride. What harm will it do? Just, you have to distinguish whether or not you have the authority to act. And if you have the authority, then maybe you should act, uh, but maybe not. I think I think I quoted uh, in an earlier lesson one of the five-star generals, uh, General of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a number of years ago, said one of the things you learn when you have this ultimate authority is not to exercise it. You don't, you don't max it out because then you'll throw your weight around. So forbear. You don't have to fix everything. Forbid not children. Children know the Lord in a way we don't know. And so it kind of gets left behind. Uh, but such is the kingdom. Don't forbid tongues. Don't forbid others from speaking in tongues, and don't forbid yourself from speaking in tongues. Don't forget to share. If you have something in an abundance, it's a candidate. It's a candidate. And so if you watch, if you have three things and you only need two, uh, watch and see if the Lord doesn't tag someone, say, hey, you know, there's a need there. Forgive 490 times. You know where that number comes. That's the 70 times seven. Uh, when Peter said, you know, should I forgive seven times? The Lord said, no, 70 times seven. Now, he did not mean that you're supposed to forgive 490 times. And when it comes to 491, you can get them. He didn't mean that. He, he gave a large number thinking, don't keep track. Don't count your way up to 490. I mean, how, how weird is that? So the idea is just forgive and keep on forgiving. And it's okay if you lose track. Uh, Matthew, you know, the verses command us to forgive. Uh, if you're bound to servitude is where you have an obligation to be fulfilled and sometimes obligations that society brings can bring a a doubt a dismay and so set it aside you, if you're fretting about something that you're engaged in where there's a certain amount of compulsion give it to the lord don't let it don't let it disturb your peace Grow up the loins of your mind, and your mind does have loins. It's uh, the loin is the area of reproduction, and so your mind can reproduce. And so, be careful. Uh, you know, when someone says, "Can I give you a piece of my mind?" Uh, I'd rather, I'd rather you didn't. <laughs> uh, so you need to gird up your mind. It has to be belted. It has to be girded. It has to be strengthened. It has to be kept in line 
or else it spills over and who knows what trouble it causes. Give place to wrath. When you feel the anger stirring, let it go. Just let it go. Whistle on happy tune. Just set it aside. Distract yourself with something else. And you'll find you actually benefited from not taking that step that you felt so strongly about. Give your enemy a drink of water. Sometimes that is the very thing that uh, solves a problem that you're having with someone is you, you do something which is a direct blessing. It's unexpected and, uh, and done in the spirit, it will disarm them. And they'll realize that you're not countering them, that you don't see them as a problem but rather you see them as someone to bless. And it makes the argument, it makes the things that makes them an enemy, it makes that matter take a second place and they'll feel it and they'll rejoice in it. And uh, sometimes God converts an enemy into a friend. It's happened before. Give no occasion to the adversary, so staying away from darkness staying away from things doubtful. Uh, as I have mentioned, he, the enemy, if he can, will just gradually pull you along a certain line. And so when you see that pattern develop, that's the time to cut that occasion off. And sometimes it's, it's a genuine occasion. It's an actual invitation. And it's the beginning of uh, of something that uh, that has a prospect of becoming worse fast. Glorify God in your body and your spirit, not only uh, keeping yourself healthy and uh, conducting your body in, in safe and wholesome ways, but also your spirit. There, there are spiritual sins. You can you can grieve the Holy Spirit with uh, with your spiritual endeavors. You're considering what you're doing is serving God, but really you're making yourself the enemy of God. And so glorify God in, in things that are spiritual as well. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can be grieved, and I would suggest that he is easily grieved. He's not uh, kind of a brave, uh, stalwart, persevering uh, force of God that will just push until uh, he wins. But rather, if you resist the Holy Spirit, he steps back. He realizes, I think, I think he looks to the Father and says, what gives? And I think maybe the Father kind of gives a signal. But grieving the Holy Spirit is something that is very easy to do and it's very difficult to to, uh, to reconcile. It's very difficult to bring it back into its uh, proper relationship. And so hold your relationship with the Holy Spirit very gently and very lovingly. And don't, uh, don't throw your weight around. Don't act like you're his boss or any such thing. But uh, give yourself to the simplicity of the spiritual life. Grow in grace and knowledge. And we're talking about that specifically. It's the grace of God in its various dimensions that will lead us on to finish our race. Don't grudge against other people. Be careful. People say things and then we remember it and we hang on to it and it festers and it affects you, affects your judgment and it affects your relationship but worse than that you uh, you start to spiral down because it's a you're embracing a darkness let it go don't harden your heart which is an interesting way of describing it that is something that you do it's um it's kind of related to a fierceness it's related to uh, one of the Bible words is implacable, P 
can't be moved. I am not going to move on this. See, that's someone who's hard in their heart. You're not going to convince me. I've, I've had people say that to me recently concerning a public matter. You are not going to convince me. And so uh, when you harden your heart, what's going to soften it? You know, but don't, uh, don't test the laws of the Spirit of God. Don't test the duty of angels uh, to see to it that God's will is being done. You, you try to force your way into some of these things and you'll find uh, there's a blunt force which uh, God sets before you and you will not penetrate it and you'll be stopped. And so sometimes when you are stopped in your tracks in something that seems so simple to be able to get done and your plan was so perfect, but this element came in, another element came in and you realize you're tied up in knots, you begin to suspect that something has happened in your heart and you, you seized on something and of course, you need the wisdom of the Lord to detect what was that so that you can step away from it. Hate the flesh, uh, spotted garments. And so the Bible portrays our behavior as clothing, a robe of righteousness. Wearing a white robe means your behavior is righteous. Having a garment that is dirty, that is spotted, especially by the flesh, is unrighteous. So learn how to wash your clothes. Get them clean in the blood of the Lamb. Don't have respect of persons. The, uh, uh, the idea is that we create a belief that somebody is something because of maybe a, an achievement they've made or maybe they're their pedigree, the name they have, where they've been, what they've done. So don't make that your criteria. In fact, uh, last time or the time before we read a scripture, you know, don't hobnob with the higher ups and the powers that be. You know, it will uh, it will tease you, and you'll be drawn into it because it's a fiercely competitive world. We don't know that the uh, those that strive for the preeminence it's fiercely competitive and many many are slain in that arena they just don't make it have the same love one for another and so that's a practice uh to keep raising our our level of concern our level of charity our level of compassion forgiveness and answer kindness with kindness and so that the love that you get is the same uh, love that you receive don't have fellowship with works of darkness and sometimes we believe that if we hobnob with it that will influence and that's not what's meant as being salt as being light and so um, don't get cozy with it create a mechanism that separates you because it will take you. Uh, look how easy it was to overcome Adam and Eve. Just, yea, hath God said, just a few words. And so the idea of fellowship is that you engage with it, with the idea, I'm going to do some good here. Yeah, I can see where there's a problem here, but you know, I, I know the Bible and I know what they need to hear. No, you're being foolish. Heal the sick. There you go. There's another one. Um, healing the sick, I believe, is another gift that every believer has. That's Mark chapter 16. These signs shall follow them. I believe they shall lay hands on the sick. And so do you practice that? How's it going? You say, well, I don't know how to heal the sick. Well, you don't need to. What you need to do is lay your hands on the sick and pray. That you can do. So let God's the one that does the healing. So that's a good lesson right there. You do your part and see what the Lord will do in his part. Help propagate truth. And so as you learn things in the Lord, it's a good idea to store it up within yourself. I, I take notes. I when I hear something, I write it down. I get it into the computer because I want to revisit it. And um, 
you never know where a source will, of truth will come. And so I'm, I'm always eyes and ears uh, ready to drink in whatever it is the Lord will, uh, will, will lead me to. And then if I can grasp it and the Lord teach me how to communicate it, then it gets propagated, propagated. And then it has, it was in one person, it was uttered and two or three picked it up and those two or three explained it to another two or three. And next thing you know, that truth is established. Humble yourselves. It's your duty. Humble yourselves in the eyes of the Lord. Just uh, take note when you pat yourself on the back. Take note when you feel pretty good about yourself. And say, whoops, I'm, I'm ahead of myself, aren't I, Lord? <laughs> uh, I'm giving myself credit when, I, when I'm not really there, right? Yeah, so there's just no need. No need to puff yourself up or um, to accept uh, something you've done or said uh, as some sort of pedigree. Don't do that. Resist it. Don't do it. Don't tell people how good you are. Don't do it. Just don't do it. Husbands, love your wives. There is a good one. It's, um, I don't know if it's in this list. It says, husbands, don't be bitter against your wife. It's, uh, the natural relationship between husband and wife is is based on love and so uh, the husband has the primary responsibility to demonstrate the love of, of of god and his own love and that's the process of support and uh, being beneficial being able to guide if it's necessary uh, to be a, a compassionate leader and at the same time uh, serving uh, your wife through whatever requests or whatever the household may be there it is there husbands don't be bitter against your wives and so it's a temptation when when you're close to someone and all the quirks are known and over time they can add up if you let them so I think it's curious. It doesn't say wives don't be bitter against your husbands. I think that that's a tell. That's an indication that uh, husbands are vulnerable in this, in this realm. Just go easy, go easy. And, uh, don't let, don't let things build uh, so that the taste of your mouth is, uh, no longer sweet instruct rebels and in meekness so uh, the rebel asserts itself against the things in their circumstances the rebel wants to make changes and uh, the idea of meekness is it's different than humility i think Meekness is the attribute where you withhold taking action that you may have had privilege to take. It's kind of a mini uh, resignation of power. Uh, you may be authorized to take stern steps, but meekness is the virtue that says, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to wait and see. I'm going to wait for um, for wisdom. So rebels won't do that. Rebels are constantly forcing their will uh, through contrary opinions and through contrary behavior. And so they need to be told. They need they need to be told what it is that they are doing. And of course, uh, the one that does the telling has to have the skill. Has to have the posture has to have the, uh, the capacity, the calling in order to do so, because otherwise it would just create a fight. And treat others according to, and so here's, here's a list. Don't rebuke an elder, 
but entreat him as a father and the younger men as brothers. The elder women as mothers, the youngers as sisters with all purity. So our relationships are also guarded and guided. And so we realize that a person's position has attached with it a certain expectation of your response toward them. You're not free just to place yourself above people and start instructing them without their permission. Don't judge. And that doesn't, that alone sounds like you're not supposed to judge, but that's, that's not the complete sense there. Jesus says, judge not lest you be judged. The idea is that the way you judge people is exactly how God will judge you. If you judge people without mercy, you will be judged without mercy. It also says elsewhere, judge nothing before the time. And that implies there are some things you let ride. Don't, don't step in. Judge nothing before the time. There'll be a time that is ripe, a time where you then can apply a sense of right and wrong and see to it that the process is whatever it is is corrected. But we tend to jump in too soon or we get lazy and we let things fester and go way beyond what should be. Have faith before God for things not condemned in the scripture. And we can, there was kind of an earlier one about that. There's a certain amount of freedom in the new covenant and you can't make that freedom something that offends someone else. You have to be careful. And if you see a brother's offended, it's you have the requirement to back off uh, from the freedom that you fully believe that you have. And you may have it, except it's overridden by this commandment. Don't do it. Know how to control your body? No. <laughs> uh, it's interesting that it's a matter of knowledge. Um, again, I'm repeating myself, but one of the best ways of guiding your body is to watch how an impulse to sin has a beginning, it has a development, it has an, an acceleration, and it has a climax when it then says, I got you. So the idea what you, you learn how to, you know how to control your body by learning how to catch these things earlier and earlier. Don't lay up yourself treasures on earth. I saw Denzel Washington give a graduation speech and he, he said, uh, your hearse is not going to have a U-Haul trailer behind it. So everybody laughed. It was a good message, by the way. It was wholesome. Lay up your treasures in heaven. They're, they are being stored there and uh, having the upward, the ability to look up and to establish things that are above is an essential part of the Christian life because there are things being laid up for you depending on the development of your life here on earth. And so the good news is that you're going to inherit what is laid up for you. The bad news is that you're going to inherit what's laid up for you. So you may, you don't want to go to the room and have it empty. <laughs> For to have a little, uh, little break there. Lay hold of eternal life. And so there's a certain aggressive posture that's necessary. Remember, the kingdom suffers violence and the violence take it by force. And so there are times and places where you need to assert yourself in things that are heavenly. Uh, make a declaration so that the, the unseen world around you understands your purpose and your intentions. Uh, and life has to be grasped, it has to be grasped. Don't let it slip through your fingers, but keep it, hold it to yourself. Leave your parents and cleave to your wife. That's of course the, uh, the, the promise uh, uh, to the young man that is ready for marriage. I was thinking uh, about divorce statistics. I learned recently, I studied, um, how the Orthodox Jew 
plans the wedding, the marriage for their youngsters. It's an arranged marriage. And what I learned, I didn't know, was that the arranged marriage allows for the opinion of, of, the, of the man or the woman. They both, either one can object. This was my understanding. So it's actually a very, uh, very healthy uh, prospect. So I do not trust the dating system here in the United States because it produces the results. What percentage gets divorced? Is it 50%? Actually, I think it's more. Do you know what the percentage divorce rate is for arranged marriage? 6%. And why is that? Because others with wisdom can see your strengths and your weaknesses and see how it's best matched with someone else's strength and weaknesses. So maybe too late for the american society to divert and do start doing that i'm not lobbying for that but i am noticing that uh, that that is the case well i think i'm going to uh, stop here we're out of time and we just have a little more to finish up so my main point is that we really didn't see anything that was a stretch or a strain uh, things that required miraculous power that of course we need and of course there are things where we have besetting sins that is a direct obstacle to obeying god but the blood of jesus and god's purposes are the provisions that he makes so that we can succeed because he is the vine and we are the branches and without him we can't be done well let's pray Lord Jesus, we thank you for all that you provide for us. We thank you for the goodness of your word. We pray, Lord, that we might have a tremendous affection toward your will, that we might exclaim to you, maybe before we go to bed tonight, that I want to do your will, Lord, and I want to grow in my love of you so that that becomes my single and most powerful motive. We pray for your blessing upon each one. We pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.